Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm sort of amazed that this, this um, talk was not only a sellout, we had a long waiting list, but somehow or other a few people have slipped away in the meantime. But maybe there will be more latecomers even coming into the very last few seats. But it is absolutely great that there has been so much interest uh, in this talk. Uh, and even though I know that Kate was here not very long ago in Cambridge giving another talk, which was also into overflow mode. So she's sort of, um, I think she's the current star of new economic thinking, actually. Now, um, I should say, first of all, with Kate, um, that I worked, I had the pleasure of working with Kate in Oxfam when she was Deputy Director of Research there. And it was about that time that Kate was doing lots of research on all sorts of campaigns, but in, as a sideline, she was working on the, the whole economic system. And um, I remember when she actually presented to me and some others the donut, and thinking, my goodness me, she's got something here, <laughs> and that she really ought to work on it. And I'm absolutely delighted that you know, what, what she has done in that time is really built up that, you know, the whole idea of, this, of the donut model and what it means in economics in the 21st century. And it's absolutely great to have her here to talk about that. Um, and to, um, to note as well as, as not just being the, the academic thinking about this, of course, Kate is a great advocate and um, she has done an enormous amount of work, for example, in, in the UN just before the SDGs because they were very interested in how that all fitted together with the SDGs. Now working also with countries and looking at the donut for any individual country. So all sorts of exciting things going on um, as well as producing actually very, very readable books. So with that, I'm going to let Kate come and get on with it and um, I know it's going to be absolutely fascinating. So all yours, Kate. Thank you very much, and thank you, Barbara. Now, is this going to be my friend? Ah, this isn't connected. I can see it on the screen here, but you can't see what I can see. That's right, he'll come down. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, particularly delighted to be back here with Barbara, who was my boss for a decade at Oxfam, and a very wonderful boss, too, who actually gener generously allowed me. I remember Barbara literally once saying, well, Kate's just going to kind of go off and come up Oh my God! You know, but but when an organisation or someone says, "Yeah, we trust you," just think and play and see what comes up. And of course, there's an onus that comes with that. But my goodness, the privilege of being given that space. Um, so thank you to Oxfam and Barbara and the spirit that we had there to allow me to do some thinking. Um, I'm really pleased to be here because what I'm telling today is actually the characters who come up in this story. Of course, the characters of Cambridge UK, Cambridge US. Uh, many of the founding fathers will walk in these streets and in Massachusetts. So it's lovely to bring their story back home, even if I'm going to come. I want to start by asking a little bit who's here. So who in this room has ever studied economics in any form, or is it high school, Econ 101, or a whole degree? Uh -huh. Right, lots of people study economics, great. And who here has never studied economics can't actually believe you've come along to a talk that had the words economics in the title? Okay, an equal number. So let's make this work for everybody. That's brilliant. So let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here because I was a teenager in the 1980s. And so, like some of you, I grew up in Fanning, Georgia. I saw Holden Yoga and Mayor, uh, Rexon Valdez, Rexon Valdez, Rexon Valdez shipping tanker spewing out oil waters. So by the end of the 80s, I just knew one thing, a very general teenage feeling of, I want to help change the world. It's a very reasonable desire when you see that. And so I thought the best thing I could do would be to go to university and learn the mother tongue of public policy. If I learned economics, I'd have the tools to take on all these challenges and help solve them. So off I went. And I can show you here. There we are. There's me with my first economics textbook in hand, just before I went to university, reading Lipsy, Positive Economics. Very excited. But when I got to university and I did PPE in Oxford, I was really frustrated by what I was taught because I felt that the theories that were on offer pushed the issues I cared most about, like social justice, like ecological integrity. I thought they were at the margins of the theory. You had to search them out. You had to do special papers if you wanted to work on that. And I stayed for four years in academic study, but after four years, I decided I didn't want to stay and do a PhD. I wanted to actually leave and immerse myself in real world economic challenges. So I spent three years in the villages of Zanzibar, 
uh, working with barefoot entrepreneurs who survived on little but their wits, the forest, and their communities. I then spent four years working on the Human Development Report in New York with the UN, uh, writing chapters Nearly economic development. And then I spent a decade at Oxfam working with Barbara, and we campaigned to show that climate change is an issue of social justice. We campaigned for women workers' rights in global supply chains. We've campaigned to make trade fair. And then I became a mother of twins, and I began to understand gender politics in a way that we only quite really do when we're changing two nappies at once. <laughs> and and all through all of this, I mean, you know, every career is in some ways just a series of bad haircuts. But it's also <laughs> a story of what you're searching for. And I, I look back and I realize that what I'd been working on all these years was trying to make visible issues that I felt were invisible or neglected or in margin of economics, whether it was social justice issues and the rights of uncontracted workers, whether it was environmental integrity and climate change. And so I left my job at Oxfam, having drawn a picture that looked a bit like a donut and realized there was, there was an appetite in the world for these kind of ideas. And I started teaching the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford and spent the last five years immersing myself in all the economic theory I was never taught. So I pushed aside my textbooks and I went to find what gets known as economic theory. I looked for institutional, behavioral, complexity economics. And I thought, what happens when you take these neglected perspectives of economics and put them at the center and see what happens when they jump on the same page? And that's really, in a theoretical kind of way, what I've tried to do in this book. And throughout all of that, I was shaped and guided by the spirit of one of America's br most brilliant last century inventors, Osmond Chisula, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Sometimes the best form of protest is to propose something new. And he talks about building a model. When we, when we think about models in economics, it's very easy to jump thinking about a set of equations. But actually, long before the equations get written, there's a far more fundamental model, which I think emerges as images and pictures. Because pictures are incredibly powerful. They can be paradigm changing. And they sneak into our visual cortex or in the back of our minds without us often realizing they're there, shaping the way we think. But they are there shaping the way we think. See, Copernicus over here, he knew the power of pictures. In the 1500s, he was watching the motion of the planets. And he knew that Ptolemy, who had put Earth unmoving at the center of the known universe, he knew that Ptolemy had it all wrong. But Copernicus waited until he was on his deathbed before he dared to publish his own alternative picture. Because he knew that by putting the sun, not Earth, at the center of the known universe, he was challenging the power of the Pope, he was questioning the role of the church, and he was upending humanity's sense of our place in the universe. So it's extraordinary what a few concentric circles can unleash. Which means, I think, we need to take on a few concentric circles of our own. It's time for our own new images. And not asking ourselves, where are we in the known universe? Although Elon Musk might be about to <laughs> tell us something new on that. But something much closer to home. What does human well-being consist in? And seeing though it sounds, it comes out looking like a donut. So let me tell you about this donut. In the whole in the middle of the place where people are falling short on life's essentials. So it's a shortfall of food, health, education, water, housing, political voice, gender equality, income, work, access to electricity. The things that make life dignified, give people opportunity. And these, I've crowdsourced them from the world's governments. They are the 12 social priorities set out in the Global Sustainable Development Goals. So they're the most contemporary statement of what the world's governments have agreed every human being has a claim to. And of course, they're rooted in 70 years of human rights. So we want everybody in the world to get out of that hole in the middle over a social foundation of foundational well-being. But, it's a big but, we also cannot overshoot the outer ring. 
because there we begin to put so much pressure on this extraordinary, living, unique, delicately balanced planet that we begin to kick it out of kilter. We, we cause climate breakdown. We acidify the oceans, cause massive biodiversity loss. And these are the nine planetary boundaries that were drawn up first in 2009 by the world's leading Earth system scientists led by Johan Rockström and Will Steffen. And they believe these are the nine critical Earth system processes that are essential to regulating Earth's stability in the Holocene-like phase that we have enjoyed for the last 11,000 years. So in the simplest of ways, you could say we need to meet the needs of all, but do it within the means of the planet. And I would propose this is one way of doing the conflict for the 21st century. We can't be to steer ourselves through this century where we know we face challenges on all these fronts. Uh, if I offer you this as a compass, though, of course, you want to know where the needles are pointing. And that's not easy to look at. Because you can see that on every one of those social foundations, we are falling far short. On food, for example, up there at the top, that little red wedge goes 11% of the way towards the middle of the circle because 11% of people don't have enough food to eat every day. You want to eliminate the red. On the one next to it, water, 9% of people don't have access to enough water every day, but that's changing all the time. Think of people in Cape Town who have almost zero, day zero on water. And the other wedge shows one person in three worldwide doesn't have access to what we call a toilet. But on every one of these dimensions, Millions or billions of people are falling short, and it's happening in countries rich and poor. And at the same time, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries. The boundary on climate change is 350 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We went over 410 parts per million in April last year. Massively over on biodiversity loss and on excessive nitrogen and phosphorus use in fertilizer. If those two lines were complete, they would hit the floor of this stage. And we're massively over on land conversion, turning too much of Earth's surface to human use. We don't even know where we are on air pollution and chemical pollution. So this is a portrait of humanity in our planetary home. It's the picture of us, the people of the early 21st century. And I believe it is the legacy for which our children's children and their children will look back and remember us this people of the early 21st century. Because we're the first generation to see this picture and probably the last to be able to do something transformational about it. And this series, this series is called Just on the Edge, but my goodness, we are way over the edge. We need to come back at least just within the edges. And that, I think, is our generational challenge. Can we turn this story around? Can we be the generation remembered for actually seeing this and doing something about it and beginning to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. Well, I think many, many things in the world need to change in order to make this happen. But my passion is to rethink the economic Because just as pictures are powerful, there are some very powerful models which can be represented in simple pictures at the heart of mainstream economics, which is taught in universities worldwide. And I'm talking here particularly about what's known as Econ 101, uh, the basic degree, because most people only do a little bit of economics and then go on and become an MP or a prime minister or a finance minister or a lawyer or a business leader or an activist. And so what's taught at the beginning to the most people is actually the economics that runs the world. It's not the economics acquired by the PhD. So the first course, I'd say, is the most important one. And I believe it's deeply out of date. Because at the heart of the economics that's been taught over the last century and still going on much today, is a small set of diagrams that encapsulate the essence of a mindset. And I'm going to give you a world view of these. But the images are so powerful because, you see, when something's represented as an image, we don't necessarily need to discuss it. It goes wordlessly into the back of our head and can stay there for decades, shaping what we see and what we don't see, what we ignore and what we put at center, without us even realizing that this framing is affecting the way we think. Because these pictures answer some of the most important questions in economics, ones that I know I certainly, in my four years of study, wasn't invited to ask. Questions like, what is the economy? And what is it for? And how does it work? 
and who are we? So I want to give you a whirlwind tour of these questions. And you shouldn't have a better tour guide than this gentleman. Let's hop over to Cambridge, Massachusetts, because this is Paul Samuelson. And 70 years ago this year, he published the seminal textbook in economics called Economics. And it sold more copies on, across America and across the world than any other textbook. And it is the mother textbook that lies under all textbooks written today. Now, Sam is teaching at MIT. He's teaching at engineering students, actually, who only needed to learn a little bit of economics on the side. So this was for them. And he knew the power that lay in this task. It wasn't about publishing in the best journals. He, he wanted to write the textbooks, as he said. I don't care who writes a nation's laws or crafts its advanced treaties, so long as I can write its economics textbooks, the best bit. The first lick is the privileged one, impinging on the beginner's tabula rasa at its most refreshing state. Yeah, Paul Samuelson thinks your mind is a blank slate and he wants to lick it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he has licked it because the diagrams he drew have shaped the way that all textbooks. So when, in the 40s, he sat down to write a textbook for his engineering students and to draw a picture of the economy, he made it easy for them. He drew it looking a bit like a radiator system. This is the diagram from the first edition of his book. He's got business and public, we would call that households, and what you can see is water flowing around and around those pipes like income. It's an incredibly important insight. It's about the circularity of flow. But the trouble is that this diagram has changed only a little bit in the last 70 years. Today, it looks more like this, and every student knows it, as probably the biggest picture you'll encounter of the economy, the circular flow of income. Right? So you've got households and business, households providing their labor and their capital. In return, they get wages and profit. And that money they use for consumer spending, and they get goods and services. So the money goes round and round, and the resources do too. And yes, there are some leakages, but they get re-injected. Some of that money doesn't go on spending. Some of it's put as savings into banks, who then turn it into investment, except that's not how banks work. Banks create money, I bet. But I'm not even going to go there today. That's a different talk. Some of it is taken off as taxes for government, who then spend it. But again, that's not the main way that government spends to create money. I'm not going to go there either. There are bigger fish to fry here today. Some of it goes through imports, but more comes back in through exports. But as you can see, it's circular and contained and closed. And this is the diagram. The basis of this model is used for measuring national income accounts. It's very useful for understanding the circular flow. It's very useful for understanding Keynes's point about having a demand which by government spending can reboot an economy when it's got depressed. But it's still the biggest picture of the economy that you will find in a mainstream textbook. And oh, the blank spaces. It makes absolutely no mention of the living world, of the energy and materials and resources that are drawn daily into the economy and then spewed out as waste and pollution. It makes absolutely no mention of the unpaid caring work done by parents, traditionally women, all the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that gets that labor fresh and ready for work every day. And it makes no mention of the commons, the place where people come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, and co-create goods and services that they value with money maybe never changing hands. Well, if the biggest picture of the economy that we have today is silent on the living world, silent on unpaid care, silent on the commons, it's silent on three of the most fundamental sources of our well-being. And those blank spaces are going to come back to bite us. What about the story of who we are? Of course, that goes back to Adam Smith. And he had a nuanced picture of this. Smith knew that markets and self-interest is powerful for making markets work but that our interest in others is essential for making society work. And he championed our generosity, our public spirit, our compassion. That was a too nuanced picture of humanity to exist in a model. So when later economists came along, like John Stuart Mill, brilliant though he was, he did something that wasn't very helpful. He said, political economy, as it was called, does not treat the whole of man's nature, nor the whole of his conduct in society, but sees him as a being who desires to possess wealth. He plucked out that character of self-interest as the DNA of humanity to put at the heart of the economic model. And he said, this may result in an absurd characterization, but no one wants 
leaves such a characterization, and indeed, this is how science must necessarily proceed. Now, future economists after him came along and they carried on that caricature and simplification, creating what we now know as rational economic man. That. He'd be a man, standing alone, money in his hand, ego in his heart, calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. Now the trouble with this character is not how absurdly narrow it is. The real trouble, and actually the most fascinating thing about him, is what looking at him does to us. Because on being told he is like us, we actually become more like him. I found this the most fascinating thing I learned as I was researching for my book. The more that economic students learn from year one to year two to year three about the character and characteristics of rational economic man, the more they come to say that they value self-interest and competition as attributes over collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. There's a reflexivity model between us and the, us, the modelled, and the model we create of ourselves. What begins as a model of man turns into a model for man, and we start to mirror him. Well, we're going to be more than 10 billion people on this planet this century. And I believe that if we continue to imagine and conduct and justify ourselves as rational economic man, we stand very little chance of thriving here together. What about how it works? This story goes back to the 1870s, when a small group of economists were desperate to make as physics. And so they look to the fifth rate of the day, Sir Isaac Newton. Here's his diagram of gravity pulling an object to rest. And so when William Stanley Jevons started drawing his diagrams, he drew them in the style of Newton. You can see how he's showing it looks like Newton. It looks like physics. It smells like physics. It must be as scientific as physics. And this diagram, this curve that you see, well, it's actually half of the first diagram encounters in their first lecture, Supply and Demand. It was built directly on an analogy to movement of gravity. So he and Valras in Switzerland wrote, just as gravity pulls a pendulum to rest, so prices pull markets into equilibrium. But as we know that when it comes to markets that really matter, like financial markets, equilibrium is not, and gravity is not a good metaphor for describing how they actually move when it comes really bigger pernicious effect of this desire to base economics on Newtonian physics because Newton had discovered the physical laws of motion. So by analogy, can economists discover the economic laws of motion? And I believe this, whether consciously or not, set off a race to find these economic laws of motion. And there are two apparent such laws that have massively influenced all of our lives in policymaking for decades. And they both look like that. So this one, first one, it's the, it's the Kuznets curve. Drawn by Simon Kuznets, a brilliant economist in 1955, he had a little bit of data on the UK, US, and Germany on what happens to inequality over time. And he drew that data on the page and he said, I think I see a pattern. Over time, as countries get richer, first inequality increases, but then it decreases. And the next thing he writes, Explain it with a hypothesis about maybe it's to do with rural to urban migration, for which he admitted he had no ground. He even said this is 5% empirical data, 95% speculation, and probably some wishful thinking. And it would be terrible if this became what he called an unwarranted dogmatic generalization. He never drew that curve, but after him, economists drew it and named it the Kuznets curve. And once it's drawn, it slips into our minds and it takes on a life of its own. And it whispers out a mantra. If you care about inequality, don't try to redistribute because you might stifle growth. Growth will even things up over time. And this, of course, underpins trickle-down economics. It underpins austerity economics. It's a theory that justifies those policies. Of course, in 2014, Simon, uh, Thomas Piketty comes along. He went back and looked at the data, and he said, you know what, Kuznets was right. That's what it showed. But he was measuring it at a very particular moment in history, from pre-war to post-war. And war destroys the capital of the wealthy, and post-war, these governments did massive public investments in health, education, and housing. So it was war and government investment and redistribution that bent that curve down, not the inherent workings of the market. 
but the idea had taken on a life of its own and has shaped policy for decades. And then the other one, it's the environmental Kuznets curve, named after Kuznets only because it looks so like his, measured in the 1990s by some economists who had data across countries on local air and water pollutants. And they said, we think we see a pattern, that over time as economies get richer first, pollution increases, but then it decreases. And once the curve is drawn, again, it whispers out its own mantra, as if to say that growth, like a well-trained child, will clean up after itself. Except it doesn't, and it won't, because when you take account of global material impacts and global emissions, this curve does not bend down. So these are false economic laws of motion. Growth does not lead to these patterns. We need to move away from looking for laws of motion and I believe move to questions of design which I'm going to come to but meanwhile they were both jolly good reasons for pursuing growth and of course this story comes back to poor old Simon Kuznets I think he would curl his toes if he could see how his ideas had been misused from the way he, from the very start the way he'd warned us not to because in the 1930s he was asked by US Congress to come up with a single number to measure the US economy and he did called it national income, we now call it GDP, but as he produced it, he said this could scarcely be taken to measure the welfare of a nation. Then asked why, well, it doesn't include the unemployment benefit. It doesn't include the value created within a community, and it's only a flow measure. It doesn't tell you anything about the change in stocks that generate that flow. So he saw all the blind spots from the beginning, but of course the temptation of that single number is too great for policymakers especially when you get the Cold War of the US versus the USSR. And so by the 1960s, W.W. W. Rostow published a book that I love so much I got myself a first edition. It's called The Stages of Economic Growth, a Non-Communist Manifesto. <laughs> you can smell the politics. And Rostow said there were five stages of economic growth that any country is going to go through. So first you have traditional society, traditional agriculture and crafts, which doesn't really have a growth drive within it. But then you get the preconditions for takeoff, as he called it, where you get the beginnings of a banking industry, you get education for work, you get mechanization, entrepreneurs. Then you get takeoff itself, where growth becomes a normal condition, and a market compound interest can bear its blessing. Then you move through to the drive to maturity, where you can have and then the fifth and final stage he describes is what he calls the era of finance and capital. When people can buy what you see as if they want, like bicycles and sewing machines, it was 1960, remember. So you can hear the implicit airplane metaphor in Rostow's theory. But of course, this plane is unlike any other. It can never be allowed to land. He left us flying into the sunset of 1960. He knew it too. He says in the text, and then... The question beyond, where history offers us only fragments. What to do when the increase in real income itself loses its charm? So he asks the question, but he didn't answer it, because he was about to become an advisor to the presidential candidate John F. Kennedy, who in the 1960s won his election on the promise of a 5% growth rate. <laughs> Sounds like somebody we know today, right? And so Rosso's job was to keep that plane flying, not to ask if or how or when it could ever be allowed to land. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of these diagrams and pointed out the caveats, the blank spots, the blind spaces, the simplifications that even their creators typically knew. It seems an absurd basis for building a theory, but I believe it's precisely in those blank spaces and blind spots and caveats that are missing that very powerful stories get written. And that, I think, is what happened just over 70 years ago. In a little Swiss village, a band of economists met, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and they said they wanted to write a new story of economics and call it neoliberalism. Now, where were they motivated from? They were motivated because they saw the rise of the totalitarian state in the USSR. And they were motivated to push back against that. Hayek particularly believed that if you give the state an inch, it'll take a mile. In fact, it'll take the whole damn lot. So you have to minimize the role of the state. Against totalitarianism quickly morphed into a market fundamentalism, the idea that market would be the first best solution for most provisions. Their ideas didn't take hold at first, but they seeded them in think tanks, in chambers of commerce, in university posts, 
And it was only in the 1980s when Reagan and Thatcher came to power, that decade of my teenage years, that these ideas got taken and put on the international stage and turned into, I think, an economic story and script by which many of our lives have been run ever since. So it's the story of economics, the neoliberal story, that stars the market because it's efficient, so we should give it free reign. It stars finance, which we were told is infallible, so trust in its ways. It stars trade, which is win-win, so open your borders. And since every great story has a villain, it stars the state, which is seen as incompetent, so don't let it meddle. These are the characters starring in that neoliberal script. And Milton Friedman was the master storyteller. If you ever watch videos of him in conversation with students in the 70s and 80s, he was brilliant and funny at telling this story. These are the main characters on stage. Others not needed so much on stage, but let's meet them anyway. Well, there's the household, but that's domestic, so you can leave it to the women. There's the commons, which we're told are tragic. We've all heard of the tragedy of the commons, therefore sell them off. Society, said Thatcher, there's no such thing as society. We can ignore that. Earth, as Julian Simon said, earth is inexhaustible. So take all you want. And power, economics, this is a positive economics. We don't need to talk about power. We don't mention it. If you look for power in a textbook, you'll only find sort of energy sector reform, but not a discussion of power itself. <coughs> I believe this story, of course, it's the front of a story, but it's not actually how things are run. As in most films, there is a great big story behind the scenes. And if you occasionally get a glimpse of this in newspaper headlines, although it's not occasional, you'll see it coming with us every day, it turns out to be a story of massive corporate funding of political parties to rig policies in favour of those parties, massive bailouts of governments of banks that actually turned out not to be infallible, but very fallible, but far too big to fail. Stories of tax havens and extraordinary inequality between workers and CEOs, and a story of massive levels of inequality in, in many of the world's richest societies. The Kuznets curve did not bend down after all. And companies playing a role in minimizing public awareness of those apparent externalities outside of the market. I believe this story built on those holes and caveats and silences in the theory has been so powerful, and I believe it's played a big role in driving us on this brink to collapse, the world that we now have. You care about inequality? That story would tell you, don't try to redistribute, because growth is what will even things up. You care about the environment? Growth will help to clean it up, except we know it doesn't and it won't. So I believe it's time for a new economic story for the 21st century, and I want to give you a whirlwind tour of that. But starting with a man from this hometown, because I love this quote from Keynes. Economics is the science of thinking in terms of models. Yes, it is, and you can do some very clever thinking in terms of models, but it's joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. And I believe right now, at the beginning of the 21st century, actually, what we mo need more than anything is not more science of thinking in terms of models, but to return to the art of choosing models that are relevant to the contemporary world, because our world is different from last century. And I believe we need to draw new pictures that are befitting of our times and that equip today's students with the mindset they desperately need if they're going to have half a chance of steering us wisely and well through this century. So, I believe, of course, it comes with new pictures. Let me give you a whirlwind tour of these. Where would you start? I would start with purpose. It was actually a question I wasn't asked to ask in my economic studies. What is the purpose of the economy? As I've suggested, one way of defining that, well, it's to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. That would be a pretty fine purpose for this century. What kind of economic mindset best equip us to take this on? What about the first diagram you teach? I would not teach supply and demand. That's as if to imply that the economy is essentially the market and the market's in equilibrium. That's two untruths in one sentence. I don't think it's a good place to start a whole degree. I would start with this, and I call this the embedded economy diagram. If you know feminist theory, if you know ecological economics or commons theory, you'll recognize they're all brought together in this picture. So you've got the economy embedded in society, its social, cultural, political institutions, embedded in the living world drawing in matter and material and spewing out waste pollution, bathed daily in a river of solar energy. And so we can ask right from the outset the core question of ecological economics, which is how big can the through flow of that economy be before it begins to disrupt the living systems on which we fundamentally depend? But also within the economy itself, 
You've got not just the market and the state, that was what was visible in Samuelson's diagram. We got obsessed with this 20th century ideological box between that, between the left and the fair free market capitalism and state loving socialism. And we couldn't see these two other fundamental forms of provisioning, the household, where we all begin every day, that space of unpaid care for our children, our partners, our parents, but also the commons, resurgent now thanks to the work of Ellen Ostrom, but also the digital commons, which is opening up so many new kinds of commons organizing, where people get together and organize, whether it's to create a, a garden on the corner of their neighborhood block or Wikipedia or Linux on the, online. So all four of these forms, I wouldn't want to live in an economy that lacked any one of those forms of provisioning because they're all incredibly powerful with unique qualities, but they work best when they work together. And I think the state has a particular responsibility not just to provide public goods, but to rebalance the space between the other, to push back the scope of the market, which has essentially colonized a lot of household space and the commons, and reclaim that space and enable market commons collaborations or state commons or market state or household commons. And finance, finally, there is a flow in service to the functioning of those four kinds of forms of provisioning. What would that look like to have a finance sector that was actually in service to society? How would we redesign finance to make that true? What about who we are? Of course we're not rational economic man. We all know that. We're far more interesting. We are self-interested, yes, but we're also... Have fixed preferences. We actually have fluid values, and I can give you an example. If I issued a survey to all of you now about your values and preferences, but for this half of the room it said consumer reaction study on the front page, and then this half of the room it said citizen reaction study, research shows that you'd fill it in differently because I activate the consumer and activate the citizen. But even the words by which we call changes the fluidity of the values we bring through. We're not dominant over the living world, we're deeply dependent and embedded in the web of life. And rather than being work-hating, perhaps it's wiser to see as ourselves as purpose-seeking. Of course, this is the area of economics in which most of this progress is underway. Behavioral economics, cognitive science, neuroscience, sociology, we are rewriting this portrait already. If any one of these areas I'm talking about is already being absorbed, yes, it's this one. But my goodness, we can't rewrite this portrait fast enough. And actually put it at the heart of models, because who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And we need a far richer portrait of ourselves to shape us this century. What about how the economy works? I wouldn't start with the supply and demand, that mechanical thinking back to Newtonian times. If you never got that joke about why did the chicken cross the road, I think the real punchline is it wanted to teach you systems thinking. So here's the elements of systems thinking. You can boil it down at its simplest to a pair of two feedback loops. So here's reinforcing feedback. And the essence of reinforcing feedback is the more you have, the more you get. So the more chickens you have, the more eggs you get. And the more eggs you have, the more chickens you get. And anything you see in life that spirals up, 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 up like this, or down, 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 is dominated by reinforcing feedback. But then there's also balancing feedback, which the essence is the more you have, the less you get back. So the more chickens you have, the more try to cross the road. But the more try to cross the road, sadly, the fewer come back. And our bodies and living systems are dominated by balancing feedback. When I we get hot, I sweat to cool me down. I cold, I shiver, which is why we all manage to sustain this incredibly similar temperature and stay alive. So things that thrive and endure tend to be balance, dominated by balancing feedback. But it's the interplay of these loops that creates most of the fascinating systems of the living world. Throw in some delay, throw in some outside factors, and you can understand the dynamics of your family relationships. You know, there's always someone who likes to wind things up and then someone who likes to calm things down. You can understand the boom and bust of stock markets, the rise of the 1%, the collapse of ecosystems. In fact, during the financial crisis, of course, when, when many economists said our models just failed, people turned to the work of the long-forgotten Hyman Minsky in the 1970s, whose financial instability hypothesis, if you read it, it's written all about these feedback loops. He writes about... Why things balance, winding up and then being balanced and offset again. So even to understand the financial crisis, this is a smarter place to, to start if you want to take complexity and dynamics to the heart of theory. Which is why I think, playfully, it's time for a metaphorical career change in economics. No longer talking and thinking about the economy in the, in the me mechanical way of moving those supply and demand curves, but more like Josephine Baker over here who's watering her garden. Thinking of the economy as a complex, adaptive, evolving system. We can't control it, 
but we can intervene in it and design it. And the space of evolutionary <coughs> economics is working over here. If we can design it then, that becomes a really interesting question. No longer searching for these apparent laws of motion, but asking questions of design. And I believe in the 21st century, we need to put two design principles at the heart of what we think the economy needs. I would say we need economies that are regenerative and distributive by design. I'll speak briefly about these. Regenerative, di di distributive by design. The 20th century was focused very much on redistributing income. I think there's a bigger chance here now to think about pre-distributing sources of wealth creation because technologies change and change the opportunity to do that. So yes, the health and education needs to be invested in every individual to enable their potential. But thinking about more distributive ways of owning land and housing, more distributive forms of enterprise, why have the corporate stock ownership model when you can have employee-owned companies, cooperatively-owned companies, and think about how that could transform ownership of work. Energy and ideas. For the first time in human history, if you look at the infrastructure of renewable energy from space, it looks like that. It is a distributed network by design. And for the first time in human history, if you look at the structure of ideas flow, it looks like that. It's the internet. It's unprecedented. We've never had the technologies of energy and ideas on our side in terms of creating a distributed economy. Can we harness that opportunity, prevent it being the network effect of winner takes all, like Google and Facebook, and actually create a distributed ownership that's far more equitable. Some examples of this happening on housing. In Chile and, and uh, uh, Argentina, the brilliant architect um, Alejandro Aravena, he realized that many people could never afford to buy a house. It's just going to be too expensive. So he thought, well, what happens? Maybe I can sell them half a house. So we start building half houses, which contain all the water and the heating and the plumbing that you need for a whole house. You could buy half a house, and then when you've got more savings in some years, you can fill the rest in. It's far more distributive form of ownership, making it accessible to more people. Enterprise. Here's the Colchester Print Group, an employee-owned company. Cooperatives somehow seen as a 19th century, last century niche thing. Actually, they're on the rise and expanding rapidly. And in the Rust Belt of America, where many industries into those buildings and open them up as co-ops. This is the Evergreen Co-op in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. They have a laundry service. They have a vegetable growing and salad growing service, showing that cooperatives can actually come in. And they're sticky. They stick around, these enterprises, because they're connected to the community. They don't up and leave when there's a wage differential opening up somewhere else. So actually, some states in the US are now offering um, tax reductions for employee-owned and cooperatively-owned companies because they know they stick around, they build community. Here we've got an energy system going in, a solar panels on a roof in Nepal, but once you adapt that as a standard, this is housing in Germany, on every roof, you have distributed ownership of the ability to generate energy. Households creating their own electricity and able to sell the surplus for the first time. Totally different from the 20th century coal mine and oil rig of centralized, massive fossil fuel control. And then here's a fab lab in Ann Arbor where any citizen can go and use 3D printers and open source software and uh, have access through the Creative Commons licensing to ideas that are shared worldwide rather than the patent and copyright controlled ideas of the 20th century or actually since the 15th century, that regime of intellectual property control. This is the open source society, not just happening in the US, it's happening here too in, in Togo in Lome. So this is a leap of ideas and technology possibility into places that never had such idea possibility before. So I think there are amazing opportunities for thinking about distributive design. And if that's one of the tasks of the 20th century, 21st century economist, I really want to be one now. Regenerative design. Through the middle of this diagram runs the degenerative linear economy, where we take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use them for a while, and throw them away. And that cuts against the cycles of the living world. So we need to bend the arrow used again and again, allowing nature to regenerate biological materials on that side, capturing value at each stage of decomposition, from wood to chipboard to sawdust, and then regenerating it again. But also the technical synthetic materials we make, like the picker, should never be thrown away or burned, but the materials should be used again and again, which means we need an economy that runs on sunlight. We're going to look up, not down, for our sources of energy this century. That Waste from one process is seen as food for another. In this space, people say there's no such thing as waste. It's just a resource in the wrong place. 
that's modular by design and open source, and I can show you the essence of the difference of that. Here I've got an iPhone glued shut, so nobody else can get in and send back what they can get in, control. And here's a Fairphone, which is designed to be open, and anyone can take the back off, and you can go online if you have paper parts. It's the absolute opposite. I believe this is the design for the 21st century. Let's look at some examples. In the slums of Kenya, one of the places where there were no toilets, there are now, because there's an enterprise called Sanity, which uh, runs a franchise. So women and men in, that cr in the community who had no livelihood before now run these toilets. Um, people can use them there as actually clean water, soap, toilet paper, clean toilet. That brings dignity. It also brings a transformation in community health. It generates money along the line. The waste is collected every day. It's turned into manure, which is sold to farmers for organic manure. At a technical level, they're closing the nitrogen loop. But at a social level, they're creating jobs. So it's regenerative and distributive by design. This is the open source vehicle. If you were to buy one, it arrives a kind of IKEA flat pack style like this. And they say, they say you can assemble it under, in under an hour if you know what you're doing. <laughs> But if you don't know what you're doing, you can get someone else to assemble it because it's open source. Anyone can go on the internet and see how it's made, how to assemble it. And once it's assembled, then that's just the basic chassis. Now you can adapt it and customize it, make it an airport buggy, a golf car, a street car. It can be 100% electricity renewable uh, street car. So it can be customized to local conditions around the world. I think this is the beginning of 21st century distributed manufacturing. I live in Oxford where minis are produced, and all the minis in the world come out of a factory in Oxford and then sh get shipped around the world full of air. We shouldn't be shipping air around the world. We should be shipping the parts and have a distributed network of people who combine and then feed that research and development back into a global hub, totally different from the old intellectual property rights style that we've inherited. And this is Houdini Sportswear, a Swedish company that make sportswear either wool, which are both organic and then compostable. They've even composted some of the clothing, turned it into soil, grown mushrooms on it, and then served it back to their customers and said, you're eating your old ski wear. <laughs> or they make it out of recycled polyester and recycled nylon. So closing the material loop. Of course, this clothing is fantastic. It's expensive. Of course, it's expensive. Like it was expensive to put a solar panel on a Worcester house in the 1970s. But if everybody, if every company is required to work in an ecosystem of resource use, that price would come down. <coughs> So I believe we need economies this century that are distributive and regenerative by design. And if, if that's the task of an economy, to think what kind of markets and regulations and commons markets collaboration and intellectual property rights design would enable that, what an exciting task to be part of. But what about growth? Rostow left us flying in that aeroplane off to the distance. And we have, as a result, economies that need to grow, whether or not they make us thrive. Oxfam's recent report this year found that 82% of global GDP growth over the past year accumulated to the top 1% in the world. So growth isn't tackling poverty on anything like the scale it is at the global level. Of course, different countries are on different growth paths. We need to disaggregate them. But I find it a real challenge that even in the world's richest countries, there is an assumption, an addiction to unending GDP growth. In fact, we're financially, politically, and socially locked into it. Financially, the institutions, because finance markets pursue that highest rate of return, put pressure on companies to show every, every quarter that they are growing sales, growing market share, and growing profits. That drives growth. Banks create money as debt, bearing interest. I believe that drives growth. Politically addicted, no. The G20 family photo, right? You don't want to get booted out. But if your GDP stops growing, you will be booted out by the next emerging powerhouse. So that's a geopolitical lock-in. Access to the seat of power means you have to have an endlessly growing economy. How do we overcome that one? And socially addicted, because after a century of consumerist propaganda, led, interestingly, by the nephew of Sigmund Freud, a man called Edward Bernays, realized that his uncle's psychotherapy could be turned into very lucrative retail therapy if we were convinced that we would transform ourselves by buying something more. Now, I don't think any of these addictions are completely insurmountable, but they deserve far more attention than they currently get. Because step back from the economy, this presumption of unending growth. You see, in nature, nothing grows forever. 
any biologist or ecologist or epidemiologist or population demographer would recognize this as nature's growth curve. Things grow and then they grow up and they mature. My twins are now nine and it costs a fortune to buy them shoes every year because their feet are growing so fast. But at some point their feet will stop growing even though they will continue to mature and thrive for their entire lifetime. Why would we imagine we could create economies that were the one system that bucks this? I mean, nature's been doing this for 3.8 billion years. That's an amazing model to learn from. So I think we need to take on this question this century, however absurd it sounds when we're locked into the workings of our current systems. And I want to replace an old metaphor, that one of the airplane, with a new one. Because I believe we need economies that enable us to thrive whether or not they grow, particularly in the world's richest countries. See, let's remember that GDP only measures the value of goods and services generated through the market and the state, not the household and the commons. If we have open source, there could be a whole rearrangement of where things are being produced and valued. We want an economy that takes us towards distributive design to meet the needs of all and regenerative by coming back to the needs of the planet. <coughs> so silly though it's going to sound, I know. I think we need to get out of the aeroplane and instead become kite surfers. Where's my kite surfer? There we are. Kite surfers. Now, has anyone in the room ever done kite surfing? Yes. There's always one. There's always one. She's there. So you'll see I haven't, but this is how I understand it, right? So kite surfer has a surfboard. Imagine that surfboard is working with the waves, the rolling waves of that regenerative economy. Right? So you're working with the design that regenerates Earth's materials with and within the cycles of the living world. We're surfing towards this new future of regenerative economy, but also there's a kite overhead. It's pulling on the winds of distributive design. So the surfboarder, surfer has a, a surfboard and a kite overhead and is working with both regenerative and distributive design, trying to pursue them both at once. How on earth do you pursue them both at once? Well, how you do it is because in the middle, you've got this little handle that you can pull up and down and use it to steer, can't you? Yeah, she's nodding. See, You use it to steer, right? And so if you watch a video, you know, like this, going up and down, up and down in response to the wind and the waves and the direction they're going. And that little movement there, I think that needs to be the future. It becomes a response variable, not a driving variable that must always be growing, but something that then becomes a response to a far greater transformation we want, which is regenerative and distributive economy that meets the needs of all within the needs of the planet. And we want an answer. China is investing $360 billion by 2020 in installing solar energy capacity. So that's a big uplift for GDP, but then once it's in, it's near zero marginal cost of generating electricity. I challenge anyone to say with confidence that they know it's either going to go up or going to go down or which way it needs to go. I believe it needs to become responsive. But so long as we have economies that are structurally dependent upon ever-growing, we cannot follow that trajectory of regenerative and distributive design. I believe this is our 21st century task. To rethink and re-enable our economies to thrive whether or not they grow. So let me pull back and say I think we need a new story to replace a story of economics in the 21st century, which has to star Earth because she's life-giving, so we have to respect her boundaries. It stars society, which is foundational. We are the most social of all mammals, so we must nurture our connections. It stars the household, its core, where we begin every day. How do we value its contribution? And it stars the market because, yeah, it's incredibly powerful, but how do we embed that power wisely? It stars the commons, they are resurgent and creative. How do we unleash that potential? And it stars the state, because of course it's essential. How do we make it accountable? As for finance, well, it should be in service. What would it mean to have finance that actually serves society? Business is incredibly innovative, but how do we give it purpose beyond maximizing dividends for shareholders? And trade, that's double-edged. How do we make it fair? As for power, of course it's pervasive. We have to talk about it and we have to check its abuse. I believe this is the beginning of a 21st century narrative for economics that could meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. Now, of course, I think it comes with new pictures because they are the deepest and most fundamental models. And I've drawn these seven ways, but I offer them just as the beginning of new pictures that we need. This is a, a drawings we've only just started creating. And I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be an economist if you want to be part of this team of reimagining the art of models that are relevant to the contemporary world. If you like 
quantification and metrics, you will be excited by this brand new website that's been launched this week by a wonderful group of ecological economists at the University of Leeds, Dan O'Neill, Julia Steinberger and others. It's called the goodlife.leeds.act.uk. They took data for 151 countries. They've created mini national donuts. They've drawn it slightly different from the way I've drawn it, but there's the UK. The UK is nearly meeting everybody's on the social threshold, nearly filling in the blue space in the middle, but way over on the ecological boundaries. Whereas here's Sri Lanka, falling short on the social, but still within ecological boundaries. There's not one country in the world that has managed to fill that social threshold within the means of the planet, because we haven't yet even started trying to do that. If you like videos and playful things, then you might enjoy these. If you believe in the power of pictures and image, I've had the privilege of working with some of the and we made one-minute animations of the seven ways to think that I set out in my book. And you can see that they're silly, they're playful, they're irreverent, which is exactly what I think we need to make it more art, make it more accessible, take it out of the equations and make it something that everybody can understand and be part of. And I'm soon going to launch a competition to come up with the eighth way of thinking, like a 21st century economist. So if you've got an eighth way brewing in your mind, watch this space. I would love to hear. So let me end there, say thank you very much. I really look forward to... Alexandra's comments, but also your comments, your critiques, your suggestions. Let's have a great discussion. Thank you. Wasn't that fabulous? <laughs> Too much to think about, Kate, even though I've heard it, some of it before. It just, every time I hear Kate, she's got a whole new wave of stuff that's have emerged in the thinking. It's absolutely fantastic. To get us going with the discussion, though, um, just before we get into uh, getting you here in the audience engaged, um, we've asked uh, one person, um, Anna Alexandrova, to just to come for five minutes and actually give us some comments on what Kate has said, just to stimulate a bit of the discussion getting going. Now, um, Anna is a senior lecturer in the philosophy of science science and in Cambridge and is at King's College here as well and it just let's give her a, a welcome to and we, we'll uh, once Alex Anna's finished we will all three of us sit here and then we'll get you all in to discuss things so Anna here you go thank you thank you thank you Kate that was amazing so Kate's uh, experience also, uh, like, like, like Kate, my experience also started as a teenager, except uh, I wasn't asking how I can change the world, I was asking who knows how to change the world. So I was asking a question about nature of knowledge, the, the epistemology of it, and that's why I became a philosopher, because uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, with the collapse of it, coming of age in the 90s, I could see a great deal of uncertainty about how to run a country, how to run the world, and none of the adults around me knew what to do. So this, uh, the very question about whether it's possible to have a knowledge about the social and uh, how to have that knowledge is what made me become a philosopher of social science. So let me uh, tell you, let me give you a philosopher's perspective on what uh, Kate has done and offer a um, friendly addendum. Uh, one of the main messages of Kate's talk is the importance of images and metaphors in our knowledge. And this is one of the big lessons of uh, uh, philosophy in 20th century, that science is not just a set of uh, sentences, or propositions, or claims, it is a worldview. And this is how it moves along, and which is why diagrams and metaphors and images are so important. So this is the lesson of the demise of logical positivism. This is the lesson of the coming of a more social way of thinking about science that we see in Thomas Kuhn. And uh, um, Kate beautifully explored the lessons of, for the, of this for economics. But there's another lesson in uh, 20th century uh, philosophy of science, and that is that it's impossible to think of uh, organization of knowledge without thinking about the norms of this knowledge, how it's made, who gets credit, and uh, who gets to teach, who gets to speak in front of audiences, who gets praised, and who gets penalized. So 
it, it wasn't, um, I, I, would, I would locate this rise of sociology of science with uh, Robert Merton, uh, a great sociologist in uh, um, Columbia University, who first articulated that science has an ethos. Um, it has a set, a set of norms about uh, how to operate. So what is the ethos of economics? Um, uh, let's not think just about the uh, rules and the, the, the um, claims and the images and the metaphors. How do economists organize themselves? And how can we add to Kate's story from this point of view? Well, so I'll give you a striking fact that I learned uh, from my colleagues uh, in the economics faculty who I come across all the time. And that is that uh, their rules of success are the most narrow rules that I've ever come across. Um, even though I'm a philosopher of science, I get to see how different sciences are organized. The rules are that in order to get tenure, in order to get promoted, in order to get anything done, uh, it's very simple, right? It's n number of articles in top n number of journals where n is, I don't know, from two to five, something like that. I asked, I, I, I didn't believe it when I first heard it. I said, are you sure it's not like top seven? Why, the, why, why not seven? Why not 10? Why, why five? It's not like I don't know the you know, economies of prestige, philosophy is also um, are full of such snobbery. But there are still far greater different ways of being a successful philosopher than being a successful economist. Are you sure it's that narrow? Yes, we're quite sure it's that narrow. <laughs> are you sure you, on, so, so that means you're not expecting to get promoted, uh, you're not expecting to become a professor. Oh no, I'm not. So, and I was thinking, my God, so these are all these brilliant people, it's not like they're lacking ideas, it's not like they're lacking metaphors. It's not like they are not creative. It's not like they're brainwashed, right? I, I teach second year economists. Um, I have the great honor and privilege to teach history and philosophy of economic thought to uh, second years. And they're not brainwashed. Um, well, of course, it's always good to get some uh, extra metaphors and get them going. But I think it's the social organization of economics that really has to go. I mean, this is not just unsustainable, it is also incredibly unjust to the talents of young economists, to, the, to their creativity, to their ideas. So my friendly addendum to Kate is that the, the powerful people in this room need to rethink rules of success in uh, economics and the powerless economists in this room, the young ones, need to rebel and resist. <laughs> That's it. Sophie, thank you so much for your talk. Um, Kate, that was really wonderful. Um, studying development studies here, um, MPhil course. Um, we had a very interesting lecture the other week that suggested that because the rate of um, consumption of environmental resources is moving at such a critical rate, the only way to solve that is to de degrowth some of the larger economies. I just wondered what your view about that was because I, I, I asked him a question about the circular economy and more sustainable ways of growing, which um, is touch upon some of the themes that you mentioned. But he was quite adamant that actually degrowthing was really the only way to um, to kind of preserve the environment. I wondered if you'd come across that in your work at all. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, first, sorry for calling you Alexandra. You can call me Rayworth if you want, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, so degrowth, I don't use that word. And I've actually, if, if, you're in, if anyone's interested, I wrote a, a pair of blogs with a brilliant leading degrowth thinker called Yorgos Kallis. We wrote a pair of blogs together. I wrote why degrowth has outgrown its own name, and he wrote the response as to why it was a good word. 
So I don't use this word because if I say degrowth, you're already all thinking different things. Does it mean GDP has to go down? That's a very narrow kind of, right? Anyone who actually says, what I want to do is make GDP go down. Well, let's just have a recession, right? So that's not what you mean by degrowth. What they mean is coming, essentially coming back within planetary limits. So from that sense, any de I think degrowthers would hear me and say, yeah, you're talking about the same thing. Is that it's about reducing overall resource use. Where I might differ from them is they might say, we believe, we have a conviction that that will necessarily mean GDP going down. Whereas, as you saw me see, saw me with my bad kite surfing technique, I believe that actually what we need is a transformation. I don't just want to see, you know, less energy be used. We need to transform our energy systems to electric vehicles, to car sharing, to solar panels. There's an awful lot of investment that has to happen, which might mean, just as China's doing with solar energy, you see some GDP going up in order to later actually maybe come down. You invest in something that will end up doing zero marginal cost. So that's what I mean when I say let's be agnostic about growth. I don't mean let's not care about it, but let's care passionately about it. Let's enable our economies to turn GDP level into a response variable that might need to go up or down as we respond. So... If we get below the level of big words like degrowth, degrowth is, and I probably agree a lot, but I find the word degrowth very unhelpful because I, I still don't know what people actually want to say by it. I just want to take one more student, if, if there is one, and then I'll take the lady in the middle if you want to get the mic there anyway. Hi, thanks for your talk as well. Uh, I was wondering, so we've seen how many economists, whenever they put forward their models and ways of thinking, they always gave us a warning and then we didn't listen to it. So if your model in 100 years becomes the norm, what warning would you have wanted people to listen to? Yeah. Thanks. Such a great question. So I have... So I'm, I'm saying these models are problematic and they're out of date and then I'm proposing some new ones. That's like walking into a trap, isn't it? Right? So the quote that's really guided me ever since I started on this project is from the statistician George Box. Some of you may know it. He said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So everything I've shown you here today is wrong because it's a model. Of course it's wrong. It misses things out. The question is, is it useful? Is the level of simplification, which is a necessary act in modelling, is it a useful way, given the context that we believe we face, given the values we hold, and given the goals we pursue? And then that's Keynes's question of the art of choosing models. So everything I've shown you in, in my ways of thinking are also wrong. I'm just arguing, I believe, that right now they're far more useful ways of being wrong. They're going to steer us much better. And I hope that people will redraw and, and recreate what I've created there. Let me just give one example. Uh, I didn't mention the word, but externalities, right? So often when I talk like this, I get economics professors get quite cross and they say, look, we absolutely know that the climate's important. We know externalities are important. We teach it. Okay, it often happens in one week, but let's put that aside. <laughs> we teach about externalities. And I say, yes, but if we're calling the breakdown of the living world an externality, <laughs> We already know there's something wrong with the theory. Pigou came up with this in the 20s. We've had nearly 100 years. Can't we come up with a better word and not leave it as something that's apparently on the outside because we've centred the market? So I would argue that that is a more wrong way of going about understanding the world. But I really want to know your view on this. Yeah, thank you. Is that OK? Thank you for your excellent question. The very uh, judgment of uh, what is a good model and what is a, a sufficiently different model from before should never be an individual judgment, which is why it's so important to unleash the creativity of economists, which is why they should not uh, um, worry that collaborating with a sociologist or a philosopher is going to be a risk to their career. They can't do that under the current conditions precisely because the judgment of what an appropriate model is, is given to the editors of top five journals. So uh, this judgment um, has to be distributed much more widely, which is why sort of the change in ideas and the change in social organization economics have to go together. Okay. Now, I'm going to take three co uh, questions because then we can um, get, get a bit more in. Now, there's a lady in the middle, and uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman over there. I'm going to leave you this time for, for sorry, a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And there's one down on the front row, so how about those? And then I'll do another second round, and then we maybe get back towards the end there. So those three, is that clear? 
hello, sorry. I hope mine follows on rather than repeats the last question. Absolutely loved and was fascinated by your idea about kite surfing and what you've just been, both of you just been saying about models. But I'm wondering with the kite surfing, you know, it's, it, it's such a, a wobble and it's such um, a, a, a tentative way of trying to balance such fast moving dynamics. Who and how? You know, when, when economi e economists at the moment haven't a clue manifestly about how to predict, accurately predict anything, uh, who and how is going to be able to guide us through that? Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm someone that's very bought into this. I have a Fairphone and your book in my hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I sit on the board of the Open Source Circular Economy Days, which is featured ah. in, the, in, in your book. Um, and I run an organization called Social Circular Economy, so social enterprises doing circular economy. Um, but it's hard, I guess, is, is the kind of general uh, crux of it. So where is the system leverage points that you see where we can start poking to go towards the boundary conditions and the tools that you've already shown us, but how do we get the, the people in power, I guess, to actually take that up? Hi, uh, my name's David. Uh, I love the talk and I agree with almost everything. Um, but I obviously want to ask a question that will challenge you. So um, you said that pictures were very you know, persuasive and they lodge in our brain. So the end of your talk you know, is all in green. Everything's nice. And um, when you have open source production, you have an open source vehicle which could be used in any sort of uh, environment. You could have shown an open source gun, um, 3D printing. This is exactly what's happened in America, um, you know, uh, where everyone can download now, um, you know, an automatic weapon and make it in their um, back room and then do what they want with it. Why should your distributed model lead to a good outcome and not? an apocalyptic one? <laughs> Great question. Oh my goodness, okay. How on earth does anybody learn kite surfing? So this lady will probably tell us, it's really hard. Is it really hard? Didn't you didn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, yeah, it's really hard. I think that's probably quite appropriate because let's not, right, you say it's all in green and it looks nice, but actually kite surfing is pretty darn hard. It's not an easy transition, which I think is why there's such a resistance to even talking about a post-presumption of growth economy. And that's why I want to say we have to have this conversation. It's our conversation of the century. I don't know what it'll look like. Of course, in the future, governments will be interested in knowing a forecast of GDP because it affects all sorts of things about government revenue and, and depending on what tax models are. But it will still be an interesting variable. How we steer that, I don't know. I don't know, I don't have all the answers. I'm just convinced that this is the way we need to go and I think it's about a big team of people. I hope there are political scientists who say, right, I'm gonna pick that up and I'm gonna run with that. People who are working on international political relations pick up that question about the G20. How do we have global governance that doesn't depend upon an ever-growing economy? This needs interdisciplinary teams to take on these questions. So yeah, maybe, maybe the fact that kite surfing is really hard is um, a good metaphor for where we are and we need to learn to do it because actually flying a plane was really hard 100 years ago, but we figured it out. Um, then, where is the second question? Oh, hello, Mr. Open Source Circular Economy. I've been so inspired by the Open Source Circular Economy folks who argue that if you want to have a circular economy, it's going to have to be open source. You can't have everybody sending this little clicker back to the manufacturer who made it and your iPhone back to Apple and your clothes back to Henny's or whoever because we're never going to do that. We own around 10,000 products. It needs to be have a little tag on it saying exactly what this material is. We can feed it into an open source ecosystem of material reuse. I find that deeply compelling. Nature works like that. Nature doesn't turn a peacock into a peacock and a daffodil into a daffodil. It turns a peacock and a daffodil into carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen and all the building blocks of life and something else comes back. But where are the points? Are? So you're living it and you're saying this is really hard. Who do you attack? Oh, that's a different question. Who do you attack? No, but so it's about transition, right? There's an, I believe there's an old economy that's predominant and it's got locked in with vested interests and money, but it's not working. And it's, we're seeing it, whether it's through finance or through contracting out, or in many ways, it's not working. 
And then there's the beginnings of a new economy, which you're embodying, which is beginning, and the seeds of the present, the seeds of the future in the present, but my goodness, it's hard to be that seed when everything else is working against you. I don't know how we make that happen otherwise, other than showing it, talking to it. And what I try to do in this book is bring enough examples of it together that you can begin to actually see this is an alternative kind of pattern. And what, what singularly, if, if you describe what you do, somebody didn't know anything about the rest of it, it sounds very fringe, weird activity, very marginal. But you know what? That's how evolution works. It's the stuff going on at the fringes, the weird stuff that actually becomes a new innovation that then gets amplified and is exactly how evolution evolves. So it's the people who are doing the stuff, the bit, you know, Bitcoin, blockchain, which takes me to the third point. Bitcoin, blockchain, you know, it's just a technology. It can be used for any good or bad, as guns have always been used for good or bad, through an arms trade or now you can print one yourself. It's a different kind of challenge that it unleashes, and of course it unleashes a massive governance question at the moment, the network effect, capture the network, you've got everybody, means we end up with Uber and Facebook and Google, and we don't want that. Um, Uber, for example, you know, that's a, a digital platform technology that is neutral in some way, but it gets harnessed by a massive venture capital investment and turned into Uber. In, in Texas, um, in the city of Austin, the same digital platform technology got turned into a taxi driver-owned app called Ride Austin. Same technology, different ideas and principles of ownership, different money goes into it, different values driving it, and you get a distributive ownership of that instead of Uber. So it can go both ways, and I think, I don't have the answer to it, but it's the critical question. Okay, now we need the governance. And it's not just an economic question, of course, it's a political question, it's about multiple forms of governance. These are exactly the kind of questions we really had fast, better step up and take on. And as soon as we, the sooner that we embrace the systems thinking, the dynamism, the uncertainty of complexity, the sooner we'll actually get good at doing this. So I don't know how we're going to do it, but it's not going to go away if, if, if I just start to, stop talking about it. People can still print out guns. Yeah, two, two, two things in response to all these, these questions. So the first one, how do we predict, how do we quantify this stuff? It's very easy. It would be a very tempting solution to dismiss stuff as uh, sort of fluffy and vague and unquantified. Until we remember that the neoliberal and the uh, growth stuff was also fluffy and unquantified and vague until it was made not so, like through a great deal of uh, efforts into producing numbers, making these numbers uniform, um, making sure that everybody uses the same cost benefit analysis, producing the green book that tells you exactly how to value goods. So, uh, that precision of economic thinking, um, it's, an, it's a manufactured precision. And the goal now is to manufacture a different kind of precision here. So we should never use the, 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 the lack of exactness as, as a reason to, to worry about what you're talking about. Can I just uh, add one? So we're yeah. we're going to go on. Just, just to go back to these, uh, this, this website that came out this week. So people have said to me for a long time, but can we, you know, you've shown us a global donut picture. Can we take it to the national? I've had to say, well, you could, but it doesn't exist. Suddenly it exists. And there's this massive scurry on the internet. People are fascinated. This paper is getting massively downloaded and the website visited because it then kicks off a whole nother layer of investigation that people can take on. Mm -hmm. So you're, I, I really like that point and I'm witnessing it. Thank you. And do you mind if yeah. I answer to this one? So this was such an important point. Uh, how do we, um, how do we, yeah, how do we value economic outcomes? Why isn't an open access gun, gun just as good? Um, this is uh, another lesson I think of Tate to make economics back into the moral science that it was. At some point, value became preference satisfaction, and if the preference is for a gun, then that gun is the value. I think that sort of an implicit lesson in all of this is that is to change the, the very idea that a good life is a life that satisfies the most preferences, whatever those preferences are. Right? So there is, a, there is a moral theory going along with it which is supposed to uh, switch uh, gears and provide the sort of answer that I hope you're looking for. Yes, all of this is horrible. Now, we're getting to the point where we're going to have to stop. I'm going to take about four points, comments, there's about a dozen out there, but I'm going to have to stop them. Somebody in black quite near the back. Um, there is a man in the middle, about three um, rows down from that, and then there's a woman here who has been waiting a long time. <coughs> and then I think I'm going to have to stop on the phone, but you have to grab Kate afterwards. 
Um, thanks very much. Actually, it follows on quite nicely from what Anna was saying. So uh, my question was going to be really to do with the fact that Adam Smith obviously was first and foremost essentially a moral philosopher before economics. So I wanted to ask you where ethics fitted into your donor economics. Oh, great. Do you want me to answer that one? Yeah, yeah, but Hold that. Yeah, my, mine should be relatively quick. Which universities are actually teaching this kind of thinking and changing their courses, and also what response are you getting from the political establishment to your ideas? Okay. My name's Jan, I'm a mature PhD student, but in history, not economics. Um, going by images, every picture you showed was of a male economist. Do we therefore conclude that that is patriarchal economics? And if so, how do we move away from that? Where does gender come in, and particularly the role of women in bringing about this kind of new um, vision that, that, that you're trying to create or think we must create? Great, okay. Ethics, universities, politics, women. Okay, ethics. So, so I said the first question to ask in economics is what is the purpose? And I showed the donut. And I proposed that as a purpose. And you could contest it, but that's ethics straight away. Because I, and I, but what I'm trying to do is put purpose straight and ethics open. These are values, right? Meeting the human rights of all and doing so with the, within the means of the planet. And so it's totally explicit and open. These are the values that we are pursuing. Um, I, interestingly, when I was in a debate in, recently in the Netherlands with an economist, and I said, well, I would teach this first. He said, aha, now you're leaving the scholar's role. You're becoming a political activist. <laughs> and I said, well, hang on a minute. When you start by teaching supply and demand, that's a political act. You're starting by foregrounding the market, and underlying the demand curve is the assumption that ability and willingness to pay is equal to utility. That's a massive ethical assumption. You're not even talking about it. So I think it's really important to put the values open and we can at least discuss them. But then there's also ethics about, as an economist, what kind of ethical practice would you take? And I'll just be brief. You know, doctors can take a Hippocratic Oath and Hippocrates thought about medical ethics. It's very similar. Medics are operating with, engaging with a complex living system of which they don't fully understand and they're, they're affecting life chances and outcomes. So there's an ethics, do no harm. Uh, don't go beyond what you know, call on others. Um, be honest about the limits of what you know. Uh, put the patient first. Why not? There's a, there's a wonderful um, economist um, called uh, Di, Di Mar George DiMartino in the US who says, well, we should have the economist ethics and the equivalent ethics because there's a danger that we follow policies that if they went as well as we hope they'll go, they would be good for everybody. But what if they don't? So it's a really interesting field of what would it mean to sign up as an economist to take some kind of oath of practice as well as putting our values centre stage. Universities, where is it being taught? Yeah, big a lot of people asking. And I think going back to Anna's point, it's being taught in very few places because most universities are chasing being at the top of that tr traditional hierarchy of who's the best according to who performs best on the REF, according to who has the articles in those journals. Some universities that know they're never going to make it to the top of that, they think, you know what, let's just go off and play another game. So University of Greenwich, Goldsmiths in London, uh, Kingston University, where Steve Keane is a professor who's very much into complexity modeling. They've decided we're never going to win at the old school game, we're going to go off in the other direction. Schumacher College, which isn't a university, but they run a master's degree. When I present this at Schumacher, they go, and? Like, this is just, this is home turf. This is just deep Schumacher. So there are places, but ecological economists, you can sometimes spot where they are. In Leeds, there's now a team of ecological economists building up, and they're realizing, let's buck the old game, let's build up a niche in this new space. So it's building up, but it's still far too small. There's not nearly enough jobs available for the amount of skill that we need to develop in this space. Political? I never wrote this book for politicians. I called it 21st century economics, not 2020 economics, which is where most political um, space can only look to. What's really given me hope is the number of political parties in this country, but also internationally, that have contacted me and been reading the book and been using the book. I was a bit amazed to find out that my book's been read by Caroline Lucas of the Green Party, been read by John McDonnell, Clive Lewis of Labour Party, and by David Davis, the Brexit minister. And it's like, wow, that's a really wide scope of people, which is wonderful, because what you don't want is to belong to a niche. So once an idea takes, you know, it, 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 it gets read across the field. Uh, but earlier this week, I met with Clive Lewis, 
um, Labour MP who said, what would it look like to bring this? We had a really good chat. Um, the Green Party came straight away and they said, well, yeah, this is just, is just home turf for us again. So it, there's a real interest internationally of parties that are saying, okay, how could we take these ideas and then make them into a way we could talk to constituents and talk to voters so they understand this. There is a hunger in politics for a new vision, which to me is a positive sign. And then lastly, women. Yes, you're absolutely right. All the pictures I showed who were all of last century's economists, so the old economics, they were all the founding fathers because they were basically mostly all men who wrote that story. And I believe there is a result that comes in a lovely story. Adam Smith, when he was writing The Wealth of Nations, he didn't marry, he didn't have kids. At the age of 43, to write his book, he moved back home with his mum. Mm. And when he wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, and the breaker that we get our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest, it was his mum who was cooking his dinner every day. You know, imagine if that critical moment, as he was penning this line, she said, Adam, dinner's on the table. He could have actually invented feminist economics back in 1776. And it would have been a totally different story. <laughs> if only. But a last comment on this. So I didn't show you, and perhaps your comment is a point to me to put the faces of the people whose theories I've drawn on. I didn't show them of the 21st century ideas, but I wrote this book, drawing on whatever I could find, and I stood back and I looked at who had most influenced me. And only then I noticed. System thinking, Donella Meadows, one of the founders of systems thinking, her book, Thinking in Systems. Uh, biomimicry thinking in terms of regenerative design, Janine Benyus, absolute phenomenal inspiration to me of thinking of how nature works and how can we learn that for human systems. Reinventing business, a brilliant analyst called Marjorie Kelly, who's written a wonderful book called Owning Our Future. So it was only after I was, oh, I've been profoundly influenced by women thinkers. And I, I'm very glad I didn't set out to do that because that would be wrong to seek that. But it's as if there's women's voices have come through spotting things that were missing. And of course, the whole history of feminist economics, going back to Marilyn Waring and Nancy Folbray and others who've contributed to that. So they're all around. Maybe I should make their faces visible on the screen. Maybe that's the point. So I'll leave there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, this is where we are, it's just a model we've got to adopt now, yeah. which is, I think, absolutely fabulous. And on your question about um, the women thing, well, of course, it, I, I, I did, it did make me think, as you said, of course, we are in the week of 100 years of women yeah. um, you know, voting, and um, you know, the, this, yeah, it goes back to the, you know, where are the, all the women in this? Um, and the next thing is to get 50 50 in Parliament, I'm quite clear. Um, all the places where decisions are made, it's just it's those it's those power questions, and it's so interesting to have that about women. I also noticed there were three women on the stage, actually, yeah. um, which is not just you know, it's the way it goes, isn't it? We're at the forefront. Now with that, I must go back to normal. Um, now um, I just wanted to thank you very much for coming. It's been great um, hearing Kate and great your questions, and there, there will be lots more. Uh, just to remind you that we will be having another lecture in the Just on the Edge series. It's just after Easter, and the, the, the leaflets are around. And it's about peak youth and the fact that we have 1.8 billion young people aged 15 to 24. What does that mean to us? Wow. Um, so that's the one after Easter. And just to also remind you, for people who haven't been around before, that this, is, this series is followed on from Capitalism on the Edge. And all the lectures that were in that particular series are now in a lovely book done particularly by Debbie Matching on the front row. And our, this is now about five and available in very cheap rates of five pounds a copy. So grab one as you go. And with that, it's time for the drinks outside and you guys take the few minutes out there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I love your comments. Uh, come with me in every talk. That'll be great. <laughs>